Hello, everyone. Wonderful to be here. Amazing conference. Finally in Ukraine. Give him a large applause. All right. So, yeah. I will be talking about how you can build resilience in your life. I think there is no 30-day program to get fit by summer or to fix your relationships or, you know, to have a perfect body or mind. Everything is uh, kind of like a fractal unfolding. You know, you have to go through the iterations. You have to go through all those mistakes, all those problems, all those challenges to emerge as new. It's like a phoenix bird, you know, rising from the ashes um, to become a better version of yourself. So that's what I'm going to be diving deep into. Personally, my journey has been in optimizing human and technology relationship. I started from learning. Uh, I'm 37 now, by the way. When I was 16, I founded my first company. And I went to the field of educational technology. And for that, I received in 2015, I received the Leonardo Award, which has been handed over to Wikipedia founder Jimmy Wales before me under the uh, title Humanity and Digitization. And then I ventured into looking at how companies and organizations, humans can work with technology in new ways, bringing social technologies to companies. And then I got into health problems while I was running a startup. I raised 1.5 million euros for a company, and I almost burned myself to the ground, and I emerged as a biohacker about seven years ago. And I've been writing this book since, uh, The Biohacker's Handbook. And Biohacking to me is health and performance optimization. How, based on lifestyle, medical and technological interventions, uh, and expert advice, guided by scientific evidence, and bioinformatics, where you gather information about your body and figure out what works for you, what is the 20% 20 20 that results in 80% of improvements. That's what biohacking is to me. In many countries, health is the absence of disease a diagnosed disease. Now, that to me is not health. That to me is sick care, where we are seeking sickness, and when we find sickness, we, we then get into interventions. To me, true health comes from figuring out kind of where is the homeostasis, where is the balance, where is the, where is the kind of sweet spot? And it's kind of, you can never really achieve it. It's kind of trying to, trying to achieve origo. You never really get to, get to that point, but at least it's worthwhile, you know, waking up every morning to figure out, like, how you can be a better version of yourself. And that's what biohacking is to me. I worked with a medical doctor and a nutrition specialist. Together we wrote this book. It's been the, in the works for five years. It's kind of the missing manual of the human body. It's, it's a guide that started from my own healing and uh, getting back to health, and uh, which became a lifestyle. And now it's in, you know, covers, over 1,500 medical references, hundreds of illustrations. I have a couple of books, by the way, with me. Uh, if you want to get one, uh, there's going to be a few. But anyway, what we've been able to do with technology is to double lifespan, from about 45-year-old to around 80 uh, in terms of expected life expectancy. I don't know what's in Ukraine, but at least in Finland, you know, the medical facilities have been able to uh, really take care of us. And it's very unlikely for someone my age to die of, let's say, an infectious disease. Actually, the highest likelihood of me dying, 70% of the case, is to get into, an, into a car accident or some kind of uh, uh, traumatic injury. And even then, the medical establishment can help me. But as we age, the complex diseases that we get into are, are going to kill us. And when you look at U.S., the estimated life expectancy has been down for the last three years. So actually, this kind of growth that we've seen in industrial times, you know, it took us a long time to get to a billion people on this planet, much shorter time to two billion, much shorter to three, four, five, six. Now, you know, our future is at stake, and it's because of our lifestyle choices, for sure. If you look at heart disease, cancer, uh, respiratory disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, stroke, you know, all of these are kind of the true killers of our times. And with modern technology, we might be able to deal with some of these chronic conditions to 
prevent disease happening. But definitely, that's kind of the biggest challenges of our times. How do we extend lifespans? Now, as you age, you will, you will get multiple different chronic health conditions that come from the fact that you, your body is decaying. These degenerative diseases are the, are the biggest problem. Now, as you age, that's, that's pretty much the highest risk that you will have. Now, in terms of aging, the point is not necessarily to live forever, but how do you slow down this process of decay so that you can have a well-functioning brain, a well-functioning body as long as you can, so that you can contribute to your life, to your work, to the people around you without you know, losing your mind or memory or uh, physical functioning. Now, I have personal experience of driving myself to the ground. I've been you know, a serial technology entrepreneur working on multiple different businesses. And in 2011, when I founded a startup company, I was still working as a management consultant for many companies. And uh, this is what I look like, you know? Doesn't look slightly different than this guy here. This guy was inflamed. He was not, you know, his brain was probably not awake. There I'm with my mentor, Luigi Canali di Rossi. And uh, yeah, I, I started getting some serious problems. Uh, for, first, it started with pain in the gut. And I didn't really feel that good. Uh, and when I ate something, the pain went away. I didn't think much about it. I noticed my energy levels were a little bit down. So... Month after month, it's the, the pain started increasing. And, and then I did what most people do in this case. I went to the doctor's office. And the doctor diagnosed an ulcer, a wound in the stomach. And I got some medication for it, proton pump inhibitors that would bring down the stomach acid levels so that the wound be, would be able to heal. Now, I started taking the medication. The pain went away, probably because not much stomach acid was causing the pain. And... I continued my work, my energy levels were still down, but I didn't have the pain. After six weeks, the pain actually suddenly uh, came back. And I went back to the doctor's office, I got uh, prescribed more pills, and she said that, yeah, some people need to eat these pills for the rest of their lives. And at this point, I went online, I started doing research into first the ulcers, then inflammatory conditions, gut issues, and so on. I realized that I shouldn't be eating these pills for a long time. There is real consequences of doing them a long period of time. And uh, you have stomach acids for a reason. So I started researching what can I do alternatively to take care of such an inflammatory condition. And uh, this research led me to PubMed, which is a database of medical literature. And I'm actually very methodological in everything that I've done in my life. And I don't believe anything that people write on forums, so I just went to the source. I started reading the research papers, and I t took a few online courses to be able to interpret the data and to understand the language. And I designed my own gut healing protocol. This was kind of the executive summary to my doctor. And the basic building blocks there were basically to sleep more. I was sleeping four hours before this, and I started sleeping more. I also, uh, in terms of diet, I looked at different compounds that would be lowering inflammation, things that would prevent inflammation, and things that would cause inflammation and would be avoiding those things. I got into some supplementation also, in terms of healing my gut, and to stress management protocols, meditation, breathing techniques, and so on. A little bit of moderate exercise. That was my protocol. And my doctor said that, hey, Temu, you know, most people, they can change their behavior. You tell them, stop smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol, uh, they still do it. They think, you know, the consequences don't really apply to them, but to some other people. And that's kind of the problem. Uh, for any doctor, you know, you should change your diet, you might be saying, but these people are not doing anything. Like, how do you, rever how do you kind of engineer those people into changing their behavior? So for me, the key approach was actually numbers, quantified self. So I started looking at how can I make this black box visible? Um, and today there is all kinds of technologies from wearable trackers like this, or this, this, this uh, watch here is actually measuring my, um, my heart rate and my stress levels and activity and steps and all that. So I started looking into 
into the data. I'm moderately stressed right now when I'm speaking. So uh, these numbers made this black box visible. I got into lab tests, I got into genetic tests, I started doing all, many things to figure out what really works and what doesn't for improving my condition. I really understood at that point what Peter Drucker met, meant uh, in management theory uh, with the term, what, uh, with the quote, what gets measured gets managed. So getting actively into the process of measuring what's going on, it directs your attention to it, and that enables you to change your behavior. And the faster the feedback loops, the feedback through any and all means of observation, uh, taking notes, uh, having a journal, or measuring things, the faster the learning also, the faster the change. So quantified self became the mirror through which I was able to understand my own behavior and my interventions and what things might be actually doing something. And uh, when I implemented this protocol after three months, I was pain-free. After four or five months, I noticed that my allergies went away. I also noticed that my brain went back online in a way. Um, I had more focus, uh, more energy. I didn't have the crashes throughout the day. So something that was designed to be temporary actually became a permanent lifestyle change. And here we are today. I've been continuing this since. And so I really learned the hard way the gut-brain connection, that when you heal your gut, you also influence your cog cognitive uh, appliances and abilities. And the way, other way around, that, you know, the ability to analyze, the ability to go deeper in what's going on in your body is also one of the ways how you can gain better understanding holistically of, of what's going on in your body so that you can heal yourself. And this brings to my mind the story of Prometheus, who was given fire, who gave fire to humanity. He actually sacrificed himself by stealing the fire from gods. Now, Heracles arranged a bargain with Zeus to exchange Chiron's immortality for the life of Prometheus, to bring him back to life, to be unchained from the rock that he was chained into. And uh, Chiron was immortal. Uh, he was the master of healing arts. Um, and he was eventually poisoned by an arrow, a poisonous arrow, that Heracles uh, made. And he tried to heal himself with herbs and failed, so he was no longer immortal. Now, the concept of wounded healer is actually what I see everywhere in the world of uh, healing, in the world of therapeutics, in the, in, the, in, you know, the biohacking community. Many of those people have been chronically sick, diseased, overweight, inflammatory conditions, all kinds of problems, and through their personal struggle, struggle they are reborn into healers, and they are motivated to help others. That's kind of also the case for myself. And Carl Jung, Carl Jung really spoke about this. Uh, he spoke about the fact that his observation was that over half of those people who get into psychoanalysis and therapy they are actually, they have their own uh, wound somewhere in their past, and which made them motivated and interested in the healing arts. And uh, that, that is kind of the potential there. If you have been wounded, you're much more capable of being empathic of other people. You actually know what they've gone through. If you had an inflammatory condition, you actually know what it's all about. You're much better able also to help them out of that condition. And uh, there is some studies that actually show that 73.9% of therapists have experienced a wounding experience leading to a career choice, why they chose to be what they are. And I, I bet many people in the audience have their own traumatic experiences, maybe psychologically or physically, what led them to this field, or to even change career. Now, all of us are potentially healers in training, because we live, you know, in this completely stressed out society, completely sick society, uh, you know, overburdened by all kinds of responsibilities to family and to work and, you know, the future generations, considering what's, what's going on on TV right now. So, there is something here that we need to learn. 
Uh, here is what you know, a typical balanced day look like in terms of sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system activation. Uh, so here in green you see the moments of recovery, and on red you see the moments of stress and activation. Now, these things should be in balance, because if you are stimulating yourself throughout the day, drinking coffee and not sleeping enough, it looks like this. You will be spending too much time in a sympathetic nervous system overactivated state, and you don't give your body the time to heal, and it will compromise your health, immune system function, organ health, and so on. It will give you diabetes or cardiovascular disease, etc. So maybe we need you know, some modern technology to help us out from there. Here is an isolator from 1925. It kind of blocks out you know, all the sensory input uh, so that you can focus on your work, you can have uh, extra oxygen coming in. Maybe we need technology like this. Maybe we need to bring isolators back to the more office environments. Or maybe we need to move to nature. This is what I noticed when I was tracking my stress levels, so continuous uh, HRV, heart rate variability measurements. Uh, when I moved to nature, I was still working as much as I do in a city environment, but what happened was that my stress levels went down by 20%. I didn't change much. So that's the view that I had every day to the ocean. And uh, I realized at that point how healing nature can be. So even though I did all the biohacks in a city environment, once I moved to nature, I got most of the benefits. And if you look at stress and the immune system, now, there are things that are related to modern lifestyle that really weakens our immune systems. Now, there are things that are enhancing our immune system. And you could you know, look at where peak performance really is. It's, it's enough stimulation, but not too much. And there are beneficial stressors, not just negative stressors, also beneficial that makes you stronger. Those are called hormetic stressors. Ex things like exercise and certain phytochemicals and the traditional Finnish sauna or eye swimming, or nature connection. Those things reduce reactive oxygen species and increase the uh, oxidative uh, antioxidant capacity and reduce the oxidative damage that is happening. And finding that balance is really enough stimulation, enough stressors, but not too much, what makes us stronger. Here's my co-author, uh, Dr. Soviarvi, you know, implementing all these different biohacks simultaneously in, a, in a Finnish nature. It just came out of a traditional Finnish sauna. Now, when you do something like this, you don't pretty much need any of this technology. But because we live in cities, we have to kind of bring ancient technologies and modern technologies together to restore that balance. So here's an immune system and nervous system protocol that I'm using. So do like four rounds of 20 minutes of sauna. It could be an infrared sauna, a traditional sauna, with some niacin and some medicinal mushrooms. And uh, yeah, it's going to stimulate your immune system. I haven't been sick for the last seven years. They did a test on my skin health and the antioxidant capacity. It was off the roof. They asked, like, how did you do this? My answer, medicinal mushrooms like chaga that has 10 times more antioxidants than coffee or chocolate, some of the highest source of antioxidants in modern diet. It's not, by the way, it's not plants. It's coffee that you're drinking. Now, looking at stress reduction, here's my protocol for stress reduction. So I would be using a photobiomodulation device with some pulse electromagnetic field therapy and some low-level vibration, using my binaural beads to you know, silence my brain and increase a little bit more the brain waves that are related to a meditative, relaxing state. And I would enhance that in different ways, like using deep breathing, deep breathing techniques for 20 minutes and I'm back in business. Now, you are a complex system that strives for balance. You know, when a doctor is looking at what's wrong, they're looking at what system is it? Is it a nervous system? Is it a skeletal system? Where is it? Um, and you can start from the microcosm up to the macrocosm of lifestyle and behavior and environmental factors, or you can go to the level of molecules, single molecules, looking at your nutritional status. Do you have all the fuel that your body really needs on a cellular level to deal with things? Is, is, is all of that in balance? Now, to become a resilient being, you start from the level of a single cell. You look at DNA, how true environmental factors that become stronger, for example, produces more heat shock proteins when you go to sauna, or cold shock proteins when you go and expose yourself to ice swimming, or different nutritional interventions that enhance autophagy or, or uh, cell renewal. Now, 
when you go to the level of mitochondria? How do you produce more mitochondria? The source for all of this is a little bit of stimulation, a little bit of stress, you know. It's not good to be, you know, nice and cozy. It's good to, you know, expose yourself to, to some difficulty occasionally, but not too much. Now, that goes to the level of the organism, to the level of you. Are you a wounded healer? Have you really faced your problems, your childhood, your generational trauma? Have you really gone deep into it instead of running away from it? To find the balance again, to be not toxic to your environment, to, to other people, but to be able to help humanity where it's going next. Now, in our bodies, we have this biological machinery that strives for balance through all these different information networks, starting from a single cell, genetics, looking at the different chemical reactions and metabolic pathways, all the electric activity go going in your nervous system that signals things so that you are better able to, to deal with environmental factors. Now, the data sources for this bionic platform are being reverse-engineered by uh, bioinformatics. So we are starting to look at you know, how this complex ecosystem is working. Medicine was all about reductionism, going you know, to, to the level uh, of looking at what single molecule is doing what. But now we have artificial intelligence, machine learning, that, and complex ways of mapping out and simulating things so that we can better understand complex interactions. That's the future of medicine. To me, bioinformatics will be for health, what microscope was for biology or telescope was for astronomy. It's kind of a new way, it's kind of a new angle through which humans can really touch something that is beyond our existing senses. Now, the future of health is in the data, and mining that data, and understanding it. Not just health records, but, you know, not just patients as consumers of healthcare services, but active participants by bringing their own data, by you know, having sensors and different ways of measuring things in their environment so that they can influence all these machine learning-based algorithms and models that can better predict the future of uh, health. Because what, we, what is happening is we are moving from healthcare that is reactive uh, to healthcare that is predictive or even prescriptive, where today you might be informed in terms of lifestyle choices that if you do this few things, you will reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease by half. Now, those are the real things that we should see in healthcare. True healthcare is preventive. Healthcare that is sick care is based on past. Healthcare that is based on predicting the future is the future. Now, starting from genetics, the cost of sequencing the human genome has gone down. Ten years ago, 10 million. Now, for less than a thousand, people like me can get you know, my genetics analyzed and I can that can influence my nutritional choices if I should be eating wheat or how much vitamin D should I be taking and if I have APOE4 and have high risk for Alzheimer's disease or cardio cardiac events. Now, I could you also look at my performance. What is this? Yeah, so this is, this is my physical side also. Like, how do I influence my performance? Epigenetics can help us understand our true age, how we are really aging. Now, looking at myself from a genome-wide analysis, all the changes that happen you know, as we age, based on population studies, I, I'm actually two years younger. So instead of 37, I'm 35. And considering the stressful life that I was living from 20 to 30, I was probably accelerating my aging. Now, in the last seven years, I've been reducing it. I hope I was you know, intelligent enough to start this earlier, but I will continue on this to slow down aging so that I can, you know, get some more years in my life. Now, I have all these different technologies to track myself and get data from my body. And there are all these sensors that you can attach on yourself. And those are becoming much more intelligent. So it's no longer just that we are blood donors, we are data donors. We donate our data for greater good of humankind. If you have a wristwatch like an Apple Watch, it might be able to... Uh, alarm you about the potential risk of getting, uh, you know, atrial fibrillation. So that's a good example of preventive uh, medicine and, and data. Now, I can analyze my uh, sleep data. That can maybe inform that I might ha be having sleep apnea, and I could, you know, get that fixed before it, it causes other problems. Now, when we combine all these different data points, we get a more granular, more detailed uh, result of where our health is going. Like the ring that I have right now can maybe 
you know, give us a combined idea of my recovery and my current state of being. Now, in Star Trek, Spock had this tree coder that he used to figure out, you know, any single human being or a planet, an environment, what's going on. So the device had all the data uh, and, and all the capability for diagnosis. We have technologies like, to, like that today. Like Dexter here can uh, analyze 34 different health conditions. It's a completely portable technology. And these things are getting smaller and smaller and more accessible and accessible. And these things are also getting inside of our bodies. So they're not just wearables, they're insidables. Like you can have a continuous blood glucose monitor that informs you of food habits, how those might be influencing your blood sugar management. And those can be also useful not just for diabetics, but also just healthy people to figure out how they can manage energy levels. What we can learn from here is that you better drink champagne than uh, some kind of juice cocktail this evening, by the way. So all these you know, latest trends in diet, what they really come back to is like, how do we maintain balance? How do we like, restore balance in our microbiome or in terms of our blood values and so on, so that we don't you know, age faster? And we see already diagnostics and therapies that are aiming to use you know, all these complex holistic lifestyle interventions to get people out of things like diabetes. We wrote something of this in the Biker's Guide to Ketosis. Uh, you can find more information online. Now, looking at my own biomarkers, in the last seven years, I've been able to reduce my risk for cardiovascular disease. I've been able to reduce my risk for getting diabetes. I've been able to reduce my risk for organ failure. And I've been able to reduce my risk of becoming an old man in terms of low testosterone. And by the way, I don't take any drugs. I don't take any hormone replacements, none of that stuff. Just, you know, nature, that heals, exercise, etc. So when I started at the age of 30, I looked like I was a 45-year-old man. Now at the age of 37, I actually look like I'm a 25-year-old man, hormonally. Health is to be in balance, and in balance leads to disease. That's what I've learned. And we have now the different means how we can get a better idea of this black box and our lifestyle to figure out how we can optimize these things individually. So we are moving from healthcare that is kind of, uh, uh, kind of one size fits all to something that tailors it exactly for you based on genetics and blood biomarkers and behavior and environmental factors and so on. Uh, so it's all about equilibrium, how we find the balance in our lives. And if we, as we move forward with our relationship with technology, and living in cities, and driving cars, and elevators, and all of those things, and sitting in chairs in front of our computers that are detrimental to our health, it's important to remember how you really find balance. And it might be that in the future, the solution is to merge with our technologies, to merge with our tools, to move from evolution by natural selection to evolution by intelligent design. So the whole industrial revolution was about automating human work with technology. Now it's more about technologies converging together and maybe integrating with us human beings. You wake up with a phone, you go to sleep with a phone. That will become a more integral part of everyday life. And what Isaac Asimov said, any, technologies, any technological advances can be dangerous. You know, the atomic bomb. The guys thought you know, that they were, we were going to have free energy. We can you know, replace all the energy sources. We saw what humans used that for. We see what people are using drones for right now. We know what people could use gene manipulation for. You know, technology on its own is not evil. It's the way how you use them, for good or for bad. And that's where, you know, Prometheus rises. We are given fire, things like the wheel, things like fire, things like biohacking. It can be used for extending lifespans. It can be also used for pretty experimental things that will kill all of us. But, you know, in the end, it's about finding balance. It's find, you know, ways of really figuring out how we can advance as a civilization. Now, I wrote some of these things into the Biker's Handbook. You can get it online. Uh, and our next book is called The Resilient Being, how you build resilience from the level of the nervous system and the organism to your relationships and all that. If you're interested in any of this, you're welcome to come over, over to Finland, where we have our five-year anniversary, 
we've been organizing now 10 events. This is our 10th event. It's going to be a celebration. A thousand people coming over who are interested in biohacking in Helsinki. So check out Biohacker Summit. With that, thank you very much. И до начала... А, есть? Прошу, пользуйтесь возможностями. Да. Переведут меня, да? Я все-таки не удержусь, прошу. Первое впечатление, когда я вас увидела, я думала вам 23, то есть это комплимент, честно. Думала, что вы будете сейчас рассказывать. Ну и второй вопрос. Ваши очки, вы их сейчас сняли. Очки это украшение тюнинг или это что-то меняет в вашем здоровье? Очки перевели. Oh, you mean these things? Вот эти, да. Вот yes, эти. Yes. So, so these glasses here that I just showed, they actually produce a blue wavelength of light. That's pretty awesome in the morning if you want to wake up or if you want to stay alert while you give a presentation because it increases the levels of dopamine. Now, this type of light we get quite a lot from computers, television, you know, uh, our mobile phones and all that. Uh, and also, uh, also artificial light. So in the evening, you may want to actually block out that light. And that's what I use these glasses for that also uh, our friend uh, Svadoslav Kanenko is also using. So I would use this in the morning and this in the evening to block out light pollution. And this in the morning, because I live, you know, in Finland, it's pitch black darkness this time of the year. It's getting darker and darker. It's going to be all dark this winter. So I need something like this to, you know, kind of restore my circadian rhythms and my, my day-night cycle. And I might use these things in the evening then to, you know, be able to continue using computers and not block the production of melatonin for example, what these wavelengths of light are signaling to our, our brains and bodies. Спасибо большое. Thank you. Thank you. Спасибо. У меня вопрос тоже. Я по-русски, чтобы больше вложить вопрос. Тоже, когда увидела вас на сцене, первое впечатление, что вы как человек из фильмов про будущее, где есть люди, которым доступно что-то, что помогает им быть молодыми и здоровыми, и при этом есть много-много-много людей, которые не могут себе этого позволить. Вот такие фильмы, как «Тайм», да, «Время», когда люди есть, живут много-много лет, а есть те, которые живут мало лет. И вот в связи с этим вопрос к вам, потому что, скорее всего, вы будете работать над собой и будете уменьшать свой возраст, так как вы и сказали. И, скорее всего, что, может быть, и через сто лет вы будете выглядеть так же, как сейчас. Какое вы видите, какое вы видите решение для того, чтобы вот такие методы, которыми вы пользуетесь, стали доступны не только избранным людям, которые себе могут это позволить, но и многим-многим людям на Земле, и чтобы они об этом sure. узнали. Спасибо. Okay, so if I understood correctly the question about, you know, that some people have access to this technology that might be even expensive, like, you know, these kind of variables and, you know, nutrient-dense foods and all that, and people who don't. Now, what is happening is, because of exponential technologies, the cost of many of these things are coming exponentially down. So if genetic analysis cost like 10 million 10 years ago, now it's a thousand, it's more affordable to, you know, generally wealthy people. It won't be long, maybe a couple of years, and it will be available in the developing countries on the field to analyze a ge rare genetic disease or maybe to influence nutritional choices. And it will be the cost of a few pennies. And that's where we are heading with these exponential technologies. If this ring costs now like 300 euros, it's going to be soon 30 euros. Soon it's mass produced somewhere and, you know, it will be everywhere in our garments. Our, everything becomes a smart wearable, what you buy from, from a so shop. Now, in terms of nutrition, uh, you can just skip the middleman, you know, all the supermarkets and go directly to the farmer. And you can get healthy food at a fraction of the price than buying it from the supermarket. Now, what I do, I forage, I gather my own food. I gather my own mushrooms, I gather my own wild plants, I gather my own chaga mushroom, and, you know, 
I can use those things. It's free. In Finland, we have this thing called every man's right. I can go to nature. It's for me to use. You know, I can go ice swimming. It's free. I can do exercise. I don't need a gym membership. I can go to a traditional Finnish sauna. You know, you can build your own sauna with, if, even if you're poor. You know, you don't need much for it. So, to me, these things can be extremely affordable, and they're becoming more affordable. The question is, how do we make these things widespread? How do we bring these things to wider general public? And it will happen, you know, through these technologies. People in developed countries, before they get electricity, they get a freaking mobile phone. They afford a mobile connection before they afford, you know, a fully functioning electric system. Now, these technologies will be integrated into it. That will be the tree coder that enables them to diagnose themselves. You know, if you want a sleep tracker, you don't need to buy this ring. You can just download a free app on your phone, like Sleep Cycle, and you can start tracking your sleep. Or you can, you know, just use a watch and take a look at the time when you went to sleep and the time when you woke up, and you can figure out how, much, how long you sleep. Now, most of us are biohackers. You know, you measure your weight. It's, it's accessible. Maybe you take blood pressure. So these things are not expensive, and they don't need to be. You don't need a photobiomodulation device, a red light device. You can go for sunshine in the morning. You can go for, for twilight when the sun goes down. But most people don't have that luxury because they live in cities. They live busy working lives. You know, those are the sick people. The people who are on the countryside, they are very healthy. Здравствуйте, спасибо за лекцию, интересную. У меня вопрос, знаете ли вы про микродозинг? Если знаете, то что вы по поводу этого думаете? Вы говорили про грибы, например, в частности, псилоцибин и другие. Как вы относитесь к тому, когда маленькими дозами некоторых наркотических или ненаркотических веществ используются, э, используются для расширения мозга, сознания и так далее? Хочу ваше мнение услышать. Спасибо. Right. Okay, so the question was about psychedelic drugs, and there is a lot of growing body of evidence for the therapeutic use of uh, psychedelic medicines. Now, John Hopkins just opened up a research center with a lot of uh, uh, funding, so that's one of the most prestigious universities in the world, and they're doing, uh, conducting research into it. And uh, so there's a lot of hope in many of these things, but I'm a bit... Uh, concerned about the fact that people are taking things like microdosing into their day-to-day -day life, that they're doing it, you know, every day. For what reason? Not to get healthy, but to perform better, you know, to be more creative, to live the modern life. They're still in the matrix, you know. They're, they're, they try to solve their business problems by expanding their minds, to be able to access their nervous system in a more amplified way. I think that's not very wise. And there is some growing body of evidence that if you do these things every day, um, for example, with LSD, there's a recent study that shows that it can actually increase uh, uh, the thickening of the heart muscle. Uh, and uh, that can lead into cardiac events eventually. So there's a reason why many of these things have been used therapeutically like maybe once in half a year, or once a year, or once in a lifetime, like in a ceremonial, uh, traditional setting by guided experts. And I think that's where the safe use is, that has been used for thousands of years, this modern approach that we use it like, uh, like mental medication as a replacement to it. Uh, we will see that probably there is not a good idea to do anything in excess, that there is a sweet balance to many things. You know, you can drink too much water, you can have too much exercise, you can have too much psychedelics also. So I think it, it's, 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 it's safe to do in some context, and the research is showing it now, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but we have to approach these things in an intelligent way. What I'm doing every day, I'm microdosing the forest. You know, I go there, I, I taste, you know, things like nettles or dandelions, and those are the true medicine to me. You know, and, and they, they are also psychedelic in a way, but in a very subtle way, you know. They're not necessarily changing drastically your consciousness, but when you do, you know, work with all these phytochemicals that don't show on labels, they do really, you know, enhance your nervous system. They, they provide the protective mechanisms for your cells to deal with external stressors. So most things that don't have a very obvious effect, like if you drink coffee, you have a very obvious effect, now, there is often a side effect 
like getting hooked to it or you get a crash or there's something other, other going on like with your adenosine hormones. Now, to find balance, you know, we should find the ways that are oiling our biological machineries. And often in terms of diet, it's not going for, you know, one size fits all. It's about diversification, you know, working with many different things, having seasonal practices of eating different things at different times of the year. That's what I've learned, at least. All right. I have questions. So people are becoming more and more susceptible from year to year uh, to threats that uh, represent data, co data collection. So mm -hmm. you uh, say that we have to become data donors and uh, this way to measure our health, uh, to improve it and control it. But uh, as we measure it, we, for example, make it available in some specific databases that might be used by, uh, by hacking, not by hacking, by pharmaceutical campaigns uh, that uh, would like to use that, that information for their interests and like right. control mm. our health. So it might be the threat for like mm. our safety. Have you ever just thought from exactly. the point? I mean, we don't have to look far. In Germany, people are very cautious about even giving their phone number to systems or you know, exposing their personal data. In the country where I come from, from Finland, 99% you know, of people have electronic identification means. We're just okay, you know, authentication with mobile apps and all that. We are kind of a digital society. But of course, that m might make us more vulnerable to the interconnected systems that we are embedded in. Now, these variables, most people don't necessarily know or understand, but even your activity data can be used indirectly to understand some things about you that you don't necessarily realize. Even if you have your steps or geolocation, that can be used to figure out if you are, you know, uh, sedentary or extremely active. It can show you if you're a man or a woman, if you are uh, where you're going for work and all that. Now, there is a great movie called uh, Gattaca, G-A-T-T-A-C-A, -A, which is about the future. It was produced in 97, I think, and it was about genetics. And in birth, they would analyze your genes and figure out the rest of your careers. We do that, you know, in military and working life already by measuring people in different ways, if, figure out if they're fitting for a job. Now, if there is a genetic data somewhere that shows that you might have a high risk of flipping out, you're probably not going to get that managerial position. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. It doesn't mean you're not able to switch off some of those genes through epigenetics that might increase your risk of becoming paranoid and schizophrenic. But, you know, still that data might be used in such a way. Insurance companies will be using these things to optimize insurance policies. And uh, people are, you know, happy to give their data in exchange for lower rates in the future. This, this shows up in statistics. Now, there is obvious risks, obviously, to, you know, donating your data for these systems. But at the same time, I'm an optimist. I'm a technological determinist and optimist. I believe that technology has more of a hope for humanity. If we, you know, let go of our disconnection with others, and we see that modern technology can be a new way of connecting us, and if I am using my health data only for my own reasons, um, it won't be as beneficial to the rest of society compared to if I shared, you know, my genetic information, my biological samples, uh, my activity data throughout my life, because those can inform um, statistical models and machine learning algorithms to help other people more. So this time we are living in is what Marshall McLuhan described as the, mo uh, as the global village that the electronic medium, which is an extension of our nervous system, is connecting us back to the tribal society, where we don't see disconnection anymore from other people. Now, that's a philosophical question, what privacy is. Because privacy is a cultural notion. Different cultures view privacy in different ways. You know, in Finland, they keep curtains closed. Uh, in the Netherlands, you know, if you have your curtains closed, it means there is something strange going on, you know? So people keep curtains open. Uh, and uh, so if I look at my blood values, and someone might you know, get an idea of my si the level of, uh, let's say, my macrophages or, or my blood sugar, is that really dangerous information? Is that 
potentially going to kill me? Uh, probably not. Is that going to inhibit my career opportunities as a biohacker? Probably not. So the way how we see information as risky on its own might not be as it is. It's not as black and white thing. So on a societal level, what I think is important that people get educated and understand better how their data is used, how it can be used. They should have control what systems, what corporations have access to it, how long they have access to it. They should have ability to cut that access. But you know what? Your data is already being used in so many different ways that you don't even realize. And we learned that through the case of Facebook, how people donate their data for all these systems, very private information, very sensitive information that can be used to you know, manipulate their political views or even figure out the condition of their health. So it's not such a, you know easy topic and it's not such an easy answer either. I think, you know, in terms of being able to uh, emerge, to, to evolve as species to the next level, we need this relationship with this technology. We need this relationship with this data that is a mirror to ourselves. But then the question is like with Prometheus, are we going to use that fire for good or are we going to use that for advancing our selfish needs as individuals or countries, you know, for dominating others uh, in companies or etc. Or are we going to use those for extending lifespans to be able to, you know, still continue existing as species, to be able to, you know, move to other planets and not destroy ourselves before, before that happens. So that's the way how I see it. I'm a philosopher. I don't have an answer. Thank you very much, Temo. Very interesting, very excited. Thank you. Let's say it.